Um, it's lovely to be chatting to you this evening. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you mostly about seals. Uh, for those of you who've signed in to look at birds, I'm afraid trying to fit birds in as well as seals is a bit tricky. So we might have to do another talk at some stage in the future. But um, to start with, uh, a very quick geography lesson. Um, the Southern Ocean uh, is this big band of water down at the bottom of the world. And uh, it might look completely empty, but there are actually loads of little islands scattered throughout it. Uh, these islands belong to a variety of countries, um, going from Heard Island, which is over here, which belongs to Australia, Kerguelen and Crozet, which belong to the French, uh, Prince Edward, which is claimed by South Africa, Bouvet, which is Norwegian, uh, there's Tristan de Kuna, and Gough and St. Helena, which are in that sort of area, which uh, are, are the UK's. And then we've got three sets of islands down here. We've got South Georgia, the South Sandwich Islands, and South Orkney. So even though it looks quite empty, there's, there's quite a lot down there. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to spend quite a lot of time on two sets of these islands. Uh, my first one was Marion Island, which belongs to South Africa, as I mentioned. And then I've spent a lot of time on South Georgia. I spent 18 months on Bird Island, which is up at the top northwestern tip of South Georgia. And then I spent a year at King Edward Point, and I've been back a few, a few times since then as well. So I'll start off with Marion. Uh, it's one of two islands. There's Marion Island and there's Prince Edward Island. Uh, Marion is slightly larger than Prince Edward. It's about 25 kilometers long, 17 k's wide, and it's about 1,000 meters in height. It's quite different from South Georgia in that it's a volcanic island. So you can see these peaks. I think you can probably see my mouse moving over them. Those are scoria cones, which are uh, dead volcanoes, basically. And the interior of the island is quite mountainous. And the exterior is this lovely band of green, uh, this green apron that sits around the edge. It's very hard to get to. Uh, it's only visited twice, a, uh, once a year by the South African icebreaker. And you get there, and that's the research base. And they drop 20 people off, and it's our paradise for a year. So quite a special little island in the middle of nowhere. That's the South African icebreaker. Everything is transported onto and taken off the island by helicopter. Uh, there's no natural duck or port or anything. And this is just a bit of an idea of what Marion looks like. So it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's volcanic. This is all black lava, which is really hard to walk around. Um, there's lots of sections which are incredibly sharp. It's almost like black glass. And then you've got these big scoria cones. And in these valleys, you've got bogs and mires, and you'll sink up to your waist if you're not careful where you're walking. The interior is absolutely spectacular with these very iron rich scoria cones. And it's quite desolate. There's not very much on the interior. Uh, it looks very Martian. And as is the case all over the world, Marion's glaciers are disappearing. This all used to be glaciated. Uh, that's all melted in the past 20 years or so. As you start coming down the island uh, to slightly lower altitudes, we've got a few seabirds. This is pretty much one of the few seabird photos that I'll include. Uh, there's a gray-headed albatross. And you get lower and you've got these beautiful grassy areas at the, on the fringes of the island. Uh, there's quite steep cliffs all the way around, but every now and then there are a few rocky beaches and it's on those rocky beaches that you find your first seals. So these are Southern elephant seals. And this was my first time working with seals. Uh, I'd done a lot of work on birds before, and birds were always my thing, but then I started working with seals and I, I haven't really looked back. So this is a, a typical beach on Marion Island. Uh, we've got elephant seal cows hauling out to pup. These are the pups over there. And there's a bull hidden away in the background. Uh, Marion's got a history of, way of sealing, and that is a, an old tripod from the sealing years, which would have been used to render down the, uh, the blubber from the seals. And hopefully the video is playing. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's playing phone, John. Thanks. So it's it's very hard not to fall in love with those those beautiful big eyes. So that was an elephant seal pup learning how to swim. So to cover some of the work that I did down there, um, we did a lot of long-term monitoring. So this picture might look a little bit strange. I'll just explain it. Uh, this is the these are the back flippers of the seal. The the bitey end is over that side. So this is an, an elephant seal bull who is relaxing on the rocks. And when he was born, he would have received a set of flipper tags. So that's the red tag that you can see over there. So every single pup that's born on Marion Island receives flipper tags. And that means that we know exactly what year they were born in. And each of these tags has got a unique code on it as well. So we know exactly who the animal is. And we usually get an idea of who the mother is as well, because we tag them uh, at birth or shortly after birth, not after birth. Uh, so we've got this long, it's, I think it's over 40 years of continuous records now, uh, including the pandemic year, which is one of the few places in the world that actually managed to get work done during the pandemic. Uh, but yes, so that's, that's a major part of our work. We do a huge amount of work with the tagging and it gives us an idea of what the population is doing at any one time. Uh, we can see trends in the population and get an idea of, of the health of the population as well. Uh, the mums come ashore and give birth, and that's a mum and her pup. And we do a lot of work with the pups, uh, collecting genetic samples and doing various bits and pieces. Uh, we weigh them once they're weaned, and this is pretty hard work because that's about 150 kgs of elephant seal in the net uh, lifted between two people. Um, health and safety regulations on Marion Island, being South African, are slightly more uh, relaxed than they are working for the British. So. Um, I, don't, I think there would have been lots of heavy lifting training required to do this job. Uh, we also do a lot of work putting tags on seals. So this is a GPS tag that's on its head. Uh, it's glued on with epoxy resin, and that'll give us all sorts of information on where the seal's going, uh, how deep it's diving, and uh, we've got all sorts of other devices that can tell us how fast they're moving, um, so we can measure the, the movement of the head to see if they're feeding or uh, determining those sort of things. So um, that's that's another aspect of the work. And it's just really fantastic. The seals are, are really inquisitive. And if you sit down for long enough, they'll eventually come plodding over to you and come have a look. Uh, they're very, very unafraid of people, which is just lovely. So those are the Elise, the Southern Elephant Seals. Uh, the other animals that I met down there were the Subantarctic Fur Seals, which are these guys here. Um, the males have got this really pretty quiff or mohawk, and the pups are just adorable. This is a subantarctic fur seal pup. Marion also is home to Antarctic fur seals. It's one of the few places in the world where you've got the two species living alongside one another. So these are Antarctic fur seals. I'll talk a lot more about those when we get to South Georgia. Uh, this is an Antarctic fur seal bull. So you can see he's missing that, that lovely hairstyle. And the fur seal pups are also just absolutely adorable. Um, very curious, very playful, very bitey when they want to be. Um, so we did a lot of work with these monitoring the population uh, and seeing how they were doing over time as well. And another aspect of the work was doing pup waves. I won't leave this photo up very long because that beard is, uh, a little bit too long, but um, we'd catch the pups and we'd weigh them every month to see how they were growing. Um, a nice fat pup is a healthy pup, which means that the ecosystem around the island is healthy. Um, so that was the first part of the work. So I think I've covered tagging, I've covered long-term monitoring and tag deployment. And the other species that I was working on uh, on Marion Island were these guys. There's uh, about 40 or I think it's increased down to about 45 uh, killer whales that swim around Marion Island. Um, they hunt seals and penguins and they swim very close to the rocks. It's one of the few places in the world that we can do lots of work with the killer whales right from the rocks. Uh, this was from the rock that I would sit on for hours on end, uh, just with a, a camera stuck on the end of the pole and stuck in the water. 
And one of the main jobs that I was doing with the killer whales, uh, which has led to lots of the work that I've done since then, is photo identification. So each whale has got unique notches in the fin. Uh, you can see this female has got two very distinct notches over there. And they also have unique scarring on the saddle patch, which is this white patch at their back. And from that, we can tell individuals apart. So you can start building up a big catalog and seeing which animals are interacting uh, with which other animals. And we can see which pups are born to, or which calves are born to which mums, and get an idea of, of how the population is doing uh, through those methods. And a lot of that required sitting on a rock for many hours on end. So this was my rock that I would sit on and wait for the killer whales to swim past. Uh, this day was particularly rough. I would have been more short if I'm sitting there, but it gives you an idea of how close they would swim by. So it's absolutely incredible. And uh, from my vantage point, this is the sort of distance I would be from the killer whales as they swim past. And quite spectacular having those. That's a, a two meter fin. Um, so it's pretty intimidating when you've got that barreling down on you. Uh, it's an absolutely amazing place. So that's a Marion Island research in a very small nutshell. Um, we'll now jump across the Southern Ocean and I'll talk to you a little bit about South Georgia. So South Georgia is significant, significantly larger than Marion Island, um, but it's quite interspersed with lots of glaciers, although those glaciers are disappearing at a very alarming rate. Uh, so I've spent quite a while on South Georgia. It's just to give you an idea of the size. Uh, it's also much higher than Marion Islands. It's about, the tallest peak is almost 3000 meters high. So that's only a few kilometers from the coast. So you've just got this enormous band of mountains just basically sprouting out of the ocean. It's one of the most spectacular places in the world. And I worked on South Georgia for a few years. I worked at Bird Island, which is that northwestern tip uh, for a year and a half. And then I went to King Edward Point for a year after that. And I managed to get down to King Edward Point last year twice um, to do some short-term projects. So Bird Island and King Edward Point, despite their close proximity to one another, are incredibly different places. Bird Island is right at the northwestern tip and King Edward Point is there. King Edward Point is protected by this huge band of mountains that sits right next to it. And it's a westerly prevailing wind. So Bird Island is uh, completely exposed to some absolutely horrendous weather. I think over the course of the 18 months that I was there, we had probably about 15 or 20 sunny days. Uh, whereas King Edward Point, there's this beautiful weather window that sits just over there and it's usually really nice and sunny and really protected. Uh, but every now and then Bird Island does produce some stunners. So this was a lovely sunny day on Bird Island. Uh, it's a very small island. It's only five kilometers long and it's one kilometer wide. That's the research base down there. That's the Roche Peak, which is about 365 meters high. And although I'm not gonna talk much about the birds, it's called Bird Island for a reason. Uh, that entire area there is covered in wandering albatross. Uh, the cliffs along here uh, have black-browed and grey-headed albatross, and there's macaroni penguins just over on the other side of the, the island there. Um, this is the Sir Ernest Shackleton, uh, which was Bass's, the British Antarctic Survey's um, previous research ship, and um, that's now been replaced by the Sir David Attenborough. And this is the Bird Island base in winter. Um, it's quite hard terrain to get around uh, when you need to walk over the island because this is all uh, quite large tussock patches. And when it's snow covered like this, you end up trying to find your footing on these tussock patches. And if you miss it, you end up going thigh deep. Usually it's pretty wet and grimy below that surface. So it's, it's quite hard going. Uh, but Bird Island is home to four people in the winter. It's about 12 people in the summer. So it's, a, it's the, the world's smallest research station in the, the sub-Antarctic. And it's an absolutely incredible place. It's got one of the highest concentrations of wildlife in the world. And 
two of the species that I was working on very kindly posed for me on this occasion. I was working on leopard seals and Antarctic fur seals. So the leopard seals hang around during the winter months, which uh, so since it's the Southern Hemisphere, that's uh, June, July, August, September, and the fur seals um, come ashore to breed in October, November, December, January, is when the, the furries are at their, at their most prolific. The fur seal work that we were doing there was also long-term monitoring. And with the, the number of fur seals on, on Bird Island, it was a lot harder to work with them uh, in many aspects compared to Marion Island because there were just so many. The bulls are incredibly aggressive, uh, incredibly territorial. They will hold their territory on the beach, which is just about a, a few square meters. And they will defend that to the death pretty much from other males that might enter their territory. And they will quite happily attack anyone who comes too close to them. So it's, it's hard work getting around them and they are incredibly intimidating to start off with. Once you learn how to read them, it's a different matter. Uh, but at the beginning, uh, I was pretty nervous of them. But to cope with dealing with angry fur seals, uh, the British Antarctic Survey has got this special study beach, which is about the size of a tennis ball. And it's got the raised gantry, which is this platform, uh, scaffold platform that's set up. And we can work from the safety of the platform and do all of our research on these seals that are on the beach. And it's incredibly intensive work. We, do, uh, we visit that beach twice a day and spend a few hours there um, monitoring the seals, seeing who's where each, we know pretty much which seal is. We, we know individual seals based on um, pit tags. So every pup that's born on that beach is lifted up onto the gantry and we give them a pit tag, which is like those little passive tags that dogs and cats have so that you can find your pets if you've lost them. And we've got a reader. So the, adam, the adults come back uh, after a few years, and we can use the reader. We just swipe it across the area where we put the tag in, and we can tell who's who. So we know exactly which animals are coming back year on year. And that gives us an idea of how the population's doing, how individuals are doing. And if we've got genetic samples from them, um, it just builds up this really, really rich database. Uh, they're absolutely lovely animals. Um, I fell for them completely during my time at Bird Island. They, they really are lovely. Um, another aspect of the work, which this one is demonstrating quite nicely, uh, is doing scat sampling or sorting through their poo. So I'd go around every 10 days and collect about 20 scats. And the fur seals don't digest everything perfectly. So there's still quite a lot of remains in there. Um, I felt like a, well, like some of the dog owners around Edinburgh who walk around after their dogs with their plastic bags, basically what I was doing with seals. And then you sort through that, that poo afterwards and um, you can tell what they've been feeding on. So it's quite pink there, as you can see. And that's due to the high krill content. So krill forms the basis of the food chain in the subantarctic. And if they're nice and pink and krilly, it means that the ecosystem is pretty healthy at the, at the time. So that's what we, we can derive a lot from what's, what the seals are dropping behind them. Uh, moving swiftly along from that. Um, it's a, a pretty crazy place to live though. This is the main door to get in and out of base. Um, So every morning is a bit of a challenge because you can't just open the door. There might be a first little pup sleeping behind it. So you have to open it very gently and then encourage them to move away just to get out and to get up to the office in the morning. So uh, an, a, a fantastic problem to have. So that was the, the first seal work. Uh, the leopard seal work, as I mentioned, photo ID with the killer whales. We did exactly the same thing with the leopard seals. Uh, each seal has got unique spots which you can see quite clearly. They've got really nice, well-defined spots. And from that, we can see which individuals are coming back year on year and just basically build up a, a 
great big photo catalog of all of the animals that are down there. I was also putting tags on the seals, which is an interesting task to do. Uh, as you can see from those teeth, they are apex predators. And so I would sneak up behind them and gingerly try and put the tags into the seals. Uh, on the land though, they are quite relaxed. They are very docile, they don't do very much on the land. Um, it's a different story in the water as this gentry penguin has unfortunately found out. Um, so that's very briefly some of the bird island work. And after that, I moved to King Edward Point. And King Edward Point, the mention is a very, very different place to Bird Island. Uh, it's incredibly mountainous. That's the research station there. And at the back, that's an old whaling station called Grit uh, This was during winter. Um, lots of snowy, snow and lots of skiing. Uh, I'm not very good at skiing, having grown up in Zimbabwe, but uh, it was beautiful nevertheless. The mountains were absolutely incredible. Uh, these peaks are just, just beautiful um, with glaciers coming down them, hanging glaciers. Uh, but that's not where the wildlife is. The wildlife is um, sort of restricted to these flat areas along the coast. And this, is, this was my main study site there, a place called Myvikin. And I would do a lot of work on these beaches, uh, monitoring the seal populations there. So as soon as you get down onto the beaches, uh, you find fur seals again. So I was back in my, in my happy place. Um, there's a mum with a very newborn pup. So we would do similar sort of work to what I was doing on Marion Island and Bird Island with the seals at you know, Big Point. And that involved lots of pupways as well. We did monthly pupways to see how the pups were doing. Uh, with more people there, uh, we always had many people willing to come and help with the pupways because they're really good fun working with these lovely little animals. But the most rewarding part of it was that a lot of the animals are just completely fearless and not affected by people at all. And you, this was during that pupway, we were all sitting around afterwards and one of these pups just came right up to us and showed no fear, just wanted to come and check us out and see what we were doing. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's some of the first seal work. And finally, the elephant seal work. So I'll just touch on this very briefly because I know we barely pressed for time. Um, but the elephant seals, Bird Island is, has very few elephant seal pups born during the course of the year. Um, there's, in my, during my summer, we had one pup born, um, whereas at King Edward Point itself, which is this station here, uh, there's usually about 200 pups born just on the beach in front of base. And it's, it's really, it's lovely, it's great, but it can be very, very noisy. And when you're trying to sleep at night and you've had this for about three weeks at a time, um, it's exhausting. So that was the sound, the lovely singing of a, a male elephant seal in the water down there, and one of the pups and the cows all shouting at each other on the beach. Uh, the work that I was doing with the elephant seals at King Edward Point mostly involved counting, and ground counts were the, the traditional way of doing things. Um, oh, it has a, just a couple of pups hanging around the post office. So when the pups wean, they, they move away further up the beaches so they're away from um, the bulls and the cows and they can um, keep clear of any, any fights or anything that are going on. Uh, so I was doing quite a lot of work with counting elephant seals. And this is a place called St. Andrews Bay, which is the largest call out of elephant seals anywhere in the world. Uh, the last time it was counted was in 1995. Um, until I flew a drone over this colony and got a full count. Uh, the drone talk, um, I mean, I could talk about drones for an hour and I've, I've done that in the past, but uh, 
I started doing research with drones on, on South Georgia in 2019, and it's proved to be a very, very, very useful way of monitoring wildlife on the island. Uh, all of those seals there, trying to get amongst them or trying to count them from the ground would be just about impossible because you've got animals hiding behind other animals. It's also incredibly dangerous because you've got big elephant seal bulls that would very easily squash a person as they busy running across the beach to attack another male. And it would be very inaccurate and time consuming. But as soon as you put a drone in there, uh, things start to open up a bit. So this is an oblique angle um, from the drone. And you can start seeing individuals far more clearly along that beach there. Uh, not to talk too much about the, the birds, but those are all king penguins at the back. Uh, St. Andrews is spectacular. We've got these glaciers, we've got mountain peaks, elephant seals, king penguins. It's one of the it's one of the most special places in the world. And any of those David Attenborough documentaries. Uh, the focus on elephant seals and penguins pretty much filmed at St. Andrews. It's, it's a spectacular place. Um, but with the drone imagery, as soon as we fly above the seals and look down, um, everything opens up beautifully. And the nice thing with elephant seals is that there's a huge uh, sexual dimorphism between bulls and cows. So that means the bulls are noticeably larger than the cows. That's a bull over there. And these are cows over here. So we can easily tell the difference between males and females, which works really well for trying to monitor populations using aerial counts. Um, so I think that's a very, very brief overview of South Georgia and Marion Island. Um, we'll quickly bounce up north, and I'll talk to you a little bit about Orkney and some of the seal work that I've been doing around here. So I moved up to Scotland in 2020, right in the midst of the pandemic, and was living on uh, the West Coast in Oban for a, about a year. And I then managed to get a job with the University of St Andrews, and a lot of it was very familiar to me. Uh, lots of working with seals and doing photo identification. So all of the skills that I'd learned down on South Georgia and Marion uh, worked quite nicely and were quite transferable to this part of the world. Uh, just to put a few things into perspective there, so we've got Dunnett Head, which is over there, Kirkwall, the thriving metropolis of Orkney, up there, and Murray and South Ronaldsey, uh, which are areas where I had some study sites. So we'll swap the beautiful mountains of South Georgia for the spectacular landscapes of um, St Margaret's Hope and rolling fields, uh, pasture, and cows. Um, for some reason, I don't have many pictures of the sheep up in Orkney. Uh, I think it's repressed memories from having to cross farmer's fields to get to my study sites and being shot there. Um, but Orkney's lovely. I really, really enjoyed my time up there. And it was all made because of the seals. So uh, as you're probably aware, there's two species of seals on the coast of the UK. Uh, we've got gray seals, which are these guys. Um, they're distinctive because they've got that big Roman nose. And we've got the smaller and far more skittish harbor seals, otherwise known as common seals, although they, they're less common than they once were. So this is a, a view that you'll usually have of a, a harbor seal. Um, it's them swimming off in the opposite direction. Uh, they are incredibly skittish. And having worked with all of the seals on South Georgia, it was quite surprising to see how skittish they were. Um, but it's fairly understandable. I mean, South Georgia's had its, its history with sealing and whaling, um, but Orkney's been inhabited for thousands and thousands of years and seals will have been hunted and persecuted for thousands of years. So it's just ingrained in the seals that if they see a, a person walking on the shore, they, they need to, to take cover and swim swim to safety. Uh, but it is still possible to do work with them and to do good work with them, and they are lovely. Uh, I've spent June, uh, June and part of July up in Orkney taking photographs of the seals. And as it is with the leopard seals and killer whales, um, harbor seals have unique patterns. 
and unique ID features. So this is a mum and a pup, and she's got some really nice spots, not quite as clear and distinctive as the, the leopard seal, but uh, they've got unique patterns and it's possible to tell these individuals apart uh, and to follow a pup through the course of its life as we go back year and year. So this pup, it's got a beautiful white crescent over there and that'll be really noticeable as it grows up. Uh, that will stay with it for life. So based on this, we can then monitor how the population is doing, see how individuals are doing over the course um, of the years, because populations of, of harbor seals are declining dramatically in Orkney and Shetland and all along the east coast of Scotland and England. Um, the population seems to be fairly stable uh, on the west coast. We've got, so I go up to to Orkney to do this work and a co-worker of mine, she goes over to Sky to do work there. And we can then monitor these two populations and see how they're doing. Um, so here we've got another mum and pup and she's also got some really lovely patterns. Um, and the, this pup would be a lot more tricky. And this is what I've been working with for the past few months is trying to identify all of these, uh, these individuals. And it's the ones with the very faint markings, which are really hard work. Uh, he's got a lovely little white spot just below the ear there. So probably be able to tell him apart as he grows up or he. Uh, working with the harbor seals, it's really important that we try and disturb them as little as possible. And to do that, it means working with them from a much further distance. Whereas the fur seals and the elephant seals and the leopard seals just about climb on top of you, uh, the harbor seals um, are miles off. Well, not miles off, but they, they're quite a distance away. So you can sort of see a few specks out on this, uh, this rocky outcrop over here. And those are the seals over there. I've got a camera set up, uh, which is connected to a spotting scope. And that gives me a really good uh, focal length to work with with these seals. Um, it's set up on a tripod because any movement in that camera uh, is going to shake the lens and that'll give you a a blurry picture. But working with these animals up there is Orkney provides a unique, interesting set of challenges. The ha comes in all the time. Um, so it's very hard to take good photo identification images of the seals if you can't see them. Uh, so when the ha is not in, it's sometimes too hot. And when it's too hot, I get a heat haze. Since it's such a long distance, uh, you get this shimmering of light. Uh, which obviously makes any pictures really, really difficult to, to try and get a good photo, ID, uh, good photo ID from. So lots of challenges to overcome. And then of course there's the midges. But in the end, this is an image from the, that setup that I had in the previous picture. And those are the sort of photographs that I can get from this, this camera setup. So it works, works very well. And it means that we're far enough away from the seals that it doesn't disturb them. Um, this is at one of my other study sites. So the seals will be on that scary out there. And I'm set up over here, hiding away from the wind and the, the midges and trying to take photos of the seals. So that's just a very brief overview of some of the, the work that I've done with seals over the past few years. Um, I'll be going back up to Orkney again in June to go and do another season up there, which I can't wait for. It's going to be really lovely uh, going to spend some more time with these animals that I'm, I'm getting to know quite well now. Uh, so yes, I think that's basically it from me. Um, I'm sure we'll have time for, for questions and any comments, or if anybody's got any questions, just let me know. Uh, feel free to post them in the chat, or uh, we can do question and answers now, I think. Uh, thank you very much, John. If you could stop uh, sharing your screen, that'd be great. Yeah, well, thank you, John. That was really quite fantastic. Some very impressive photographs and uh, certainly a very impressive beard early on there. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, those, those sort of places, it's, it's very difficult to, to not take good uh good photos it's the the wildlife and the landscapes and things they're yeah. absolutely incredible
Anyways, as I say, some fantastic photographs, and I'm sure you really enjoyed the scat collecting. Oh, yeah, the scat collecting. I'm sure that must have been the highlight of the week. <laughs> um, we've got one question in the chat room already, but I'm going to start with a couple because there was something about the orca fins in the, in the Southern Ocean. What causes those notches? Is it, is it predatory, or is it uh, fighting, or is it... Um, hereditary or is it what they're born with? A lot of it's caused from other orcas just they tend to play quite a lot. Okay. Um, and you'll see rake marks down the side of, of really young calves and it's just from playing. Um, okay. A, a, a lot of it is from from other orca. And, and the other one, uh, why are the harbour seals declining in the east coast but not in the west? So that's something that we're trying to figure out at the moment. Um, there's been a, a dramatic decline in the East Coast, and we're not entirely sure why that is happening. It could be because of uh, increasing numbers in grey seals. The grey seal population is, is going up quite fast. Uh, so it could be competition from greys for food, or it could be predation from greys. I did see quite a few interactions with, uh, with grey seals playing quite aggressively with harbour seal pups while I was up in Orkney. So that's, that's a possibility. Um, other things could be toxic algal blooms. Uh, there's, we, we're still trying to, trying to figure that out. And okay. there's a, a whole program set up to try and work out why this is happening. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Now we've got a few questions coming in. Um, I'll, I'll let the people asking the question, uh, if they want to ask the questions in person or if you want me to, uh, ask them for you. So Rona, Rona Smythe, do you want to ask you a question? Hi there, yeah, I'm just interested, what, what camera kit do you use? Um, it, it's changed over the years. So when I was on Marion Island, I've, I've used Canon cameras over the years. Uh, I'm currently using a full frame Canon camera 5D. Uh, when I'm up in Orkney, it's, I think it's a 60 or 600D. Um, so it's mostly Canons, um, mm -hmm. and the the spotting scope setup that I use in in Orkney is quite a quite an interesting one because it's it's that big spotting scope which is a Swarovski um, top of the line spotting scope. It's lovely, and there's a special adapter that you use to connect the camera onto that. Uh, so that's, yeah, I've not seen that before, but that's interesting. Really hmm. good to know. Yeah, yeah you get you get a, a much longer focal length with that. So. Yeah, and yeah. take photos from much further away. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, my next question was from Anne Bullman, and the question is, why do the fur seals spend the night on the Portshear hut in such large numbers? <laughs> um, it's basically just the number of fur seals that are around. There are <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of seals born on that island every year, uh, so you just end up with, with seals everywhere. Um, I guess they quite like it as well because it's a nice dry, flat surface for them to, to lie on. Uh, so they, they're out of the water and um, they, they just like to get underfoot, I think. Uh, the pups are absolutely adorable. They're really lovely. Yeah, they certainly seem friendly, that was for sure. Mm. We've, um, we've got to be quite careful with, with leaving doors open. Uh, there was one day when I came back from, from scat collecting and we left the lab door open just to get some air in because the scats don't always smell great. And within a few minutes, we had 10 pups all just come inside and start wandering around, having a look at things. So. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Um, Avril, Avril Logan, do you want to ask your question? Um, yes, yes, I'll ask my question. Thank you. Uh, when you attach the, uh, the monitor tracker thing to the seal's forehead, how long does it actually stay on for? So it'll, the seals, the elephant seals go through what's called the catastrophic molt, um, which means that once a year they come ashore and they're ashore for a few weeks. And during that time, they lose an entire layer of skin and all of their fur. Uh, during that time, they, they don't go out to sea because they, um, they've, they've lost all of that protection from that. So we tend to put the devices on a few months before that. And when the seals come ashore to molt, uh, that device will then fall off during the molt. So it, it depends how long in advance we put it on for. 
the, the maximum length of time would be a year. Uh, there are other tags that we use, um, which are much smaller. They, they're sort of the size of a, um, I guess one of those, a fairly small um, battery, one of the, the watch battery type things. And those we can connect to a flipper tag, like those tags that we had, uh, that I showed you at the beginning. And they last for much longer, uh, but they don't give as fine a detail in tracking where the seals go. Um, so we can use those uh, and yeah, but those need to be collected at the end. A lot of these satellite tags, they'll ping the data up to a satellite so we can actually track in real time to see where the seals are going and, and what they're doing. Thank you. Great. Uh, Sandy, do you want to ask you a question? Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, John, do you have a, a wish list of places to visit? Where's, where's the holy grail for, for seal <laughs> photography or general sea life <laughs> photography? To, to be honest, South Georgia is, is the place. Um, yep. I think St. Andrews Bay is one of the most spectacular places in the world. Um, it really, the, especially during the breeding season with the, with the elephant seals ashore there. Uh, Bird Island with that many fur seals, it's, it's just magic. Um, I, I would, if I had to go to a new place, I'm not too sure. Namibia would be good. There's big colonies of fur seals on the, on the coast of Namibia. Mm -hmm. And the, I, had a I had a whole trip planned to go and do that. But then, of course, all plans changed when the pandemic hit. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, Namibia would be, would be high up on the list for me, I think. Good, good luck. I hope you get that. They're great photos. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, I have, no, I have no more questions in the chat room. Does anybody else have any questions they would like to ask? Because if not, I'm going to say thank you very much indeed, um, John, and again, some really impressive photographs. Um, and I'm sure you could enter some of those for a competition and win. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm glad I had the chance to, to chat to all of you this evening. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, well, um, I'll, just, I'll just remind everybody that there's information on the St. Andrews website about the Harbour, Harbour Seals Decline Project. And there's not just yourself. Would you like to say a couple of words about the project itself just before we finish off? Um, I'm not too sure what I could say that the website won't. All right, okay. Uh, there's one other, one other side of things that people can have a look at if they'd like to. Um, there's a there's a project going on at the moment on Marion Island, and uh, Marion has got mice on it. Uh, like all of these islands that have invasive species, uh, the natural wildlife is not used to having predators on the island, and the mice have started attacking the albatross. Uh, they climb up, up onto the back of the heads of the wanderers and just basically feed on them. So. There's a, a project going on at the moment, which I would encourage you to go and have a look at. There's a website called Mouse Free Marion, and they are busy trying to raise money to try and uh, clear the, the island of, of mice. So that's that's something if you'd yeah. if you'd like to go and have a look at that, I would encourage you to to do so. It's a an amazing place, and maybe I'll maybe I'll do a bird talk at some stage. Yeah, uh, there's somebody asking here if you do a talk on birds, yeah, and uh, I mean, we, we did introduce this, this as cetaceans and seabirds, and I did see some seabirds in the, in the background, so, mm. but we'll talk to you about doing a talk on birds some, sometime in the future. Mm. Uh, anyway, thank you very much indeed, John, and um, uh, just for the people on, online, our next talk is on Scottish lichens. Uh, which is on the 17th of March. So I look forward to seeing you all then. And again, John, thank you very much indeed. And good luck with your uh, photography this year. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye now. Cheers.